Good day, everyone. I read to you from Psalm 118. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house. Jesus entered Jerusalem, went into the temple, 
and looked around at everything. But since it was already late in the day, he went out to Bethany with the twelve disciples. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God for his word. That's the celebration, that's 
the people who know that this is the Messiah, that that freedom is given to take whatever you need for this celebration to happen. When Jesus gets on his donkey, he starts that journey into Jerusalem and the way in which you would welcome a king would be to lay down your coats, lay down these palm branches, lay down like a bit of an aisle for people entering in. So said, so done. The people spontaneously respond to Jesus' presence by welcoming him like that royal king in this royal city of David. Now, when he comes, He's welcomed using certain words, and you would have heard the same words from this passage in Mark 11 as you heard from the psalmist in Psalm 118. Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. These are words of welcome to a traveler, a pilgrim, into the temple. But more than that, these are words that are used to indicate that this royal lineage of David has now entered. And that anticipation of change at a political level is what's in the minds and hearts of the people at the time. We are using the passage from Mark, and Mark is one of those writers who always thinks about the way in which Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, how that aligns with his royal nature and the way in which concrete change would happen by influencing the politics, influencing the legal system, influencing ways of justice. That's how Mark conceives of this Messiah. Because he's thinking of it like David. David who came into power as a king. David who commanded armies and overthrew all of the evil persons around him. David who then built the city of Jerusalem and then followed by Solomon. So that's why Mark is thinking about building this story around this Jesus, around this Savior, this Christ, this Messiah, as someone who is coming to be just like David. But remember, Jesus chooses a different path. Jesus deliberately chooses a colt instead of a war horse. It's not a stallion, it's not anything grand. This poor donkey never even carries somebody before. He shows his humility. He shows that he comes in peace and not for violence or for war. He comes into Jerusalem and he disrupts all the things that are happening. It might have been something simple. It might have been something that only affected a small portion of the city, but yet it had a ripple effect. All of the scribes, all of the Pharisees, all of the chief priests, all those who were leaders in the religious and to an extent the political world took notice of this disruption. It is not one of their leaders coming through, but it's someone who has sided with the people. It's someone who has heralded change. When Jesus comes into Jerusalem, there is a very mellow, anti-dramatic type of um, ending to this story. You see, when he enters into Jerusalem, finally, we are told he looks around, and it was late, and then he goes to Bethany. There isn't a banquet, there isn't a feast, there isn't a party, there is no festivity, there is no ritual, there is no sacrifice, none of that happens. And it should make us take note that this is not someone that would be welcomed by the masses in that way. This is not someone that would be welcomed by those who keep the status quo. And so when Jesus comes with that disruption, when Jesus comes with that subversion against everything that the people would have stood for at the time, people are scared. Those who are in power become afraid of what this person might do, what power he may hold, 
whether or not he comes on a donkey or a war horse. Some of the things Jesus disrupts in a very subversive way, in a way that people may not have realized at first, is by those conscious choices he makes to kind of mimic what a Roman king would have done, to kind of mimic what grand celebrations might be thrown for a prince riding through the streets. But at the same time, he makes sure that people know maybe this is a, a little ridiculous. That this isn't what a welcome for God's servant should be like. And I think about it as something fairly similar to our carnival in Trinidad. The ways in which old masks were developed and all of our traditional mass characters that are meant to mock and to mimic and to have that subversive effect to cry out for freedom and speak out against the injustices of the people and it's done in a way that their masters would not have realized. And so we have this Jesus now saying, time to change, time to disrupt, time to distract those around you who are causing this oppression. Time to wake somebody up who is indifferent and refusing to see what is happening around them. And so today I ask you to think about the world that we live in and what are the things that we may be called to disrupt around us. What are the things that even in the life of our church that we may be called to hold a procession down the middle of the aisle to ensure that it never happens again or that we speak out for those who have been wronged in our nation. This is a call from Jesus for us to be disruptive, to not just toe the line, but instead we draw together who we are as church and who we are as nation, that that border that is existing sometimes in our minds now melts together so we recognize that we are not just God's people inside the church, but we are God's people outside of the building as well. And so as you spend this time contemplating, we also remember that this is the beginning of the Passion Week. That disruption comes at a cost, and it very much costs Jesus, his life. And we have to be prepared as well to know what would be the price that we pay. Sometimes we can act in a way that nobody knows it's us. It's done anonymously. It's done in such a quiet, clever way that our message gets through and people who need to be protected are protected. But we must always keep that in mind that as followers of Christ, we pick up the cross and we walk as well. In the name of God, the Creator, Christ our Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, our Sustainer and Daddy,
Now and forevermore. 